Happy Wednesday out there, Team 42. It's your skipper here at Darius Dale to present another episode of Proto Pro Live. I'm joined by our friend Dylan LeClaire, repeat guest on the program. How are you doing today, Dylan? Fantastic, Darius. I'm excited for this one. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure to have you, man. Uh, you're one of the sharpest minds I've seen. I told you this last time you were on the program, man. I've been rarely uh, dazzled by the the sharpness, the wit, and the and analytical uh, capabilities of someone such as young as so, someone as young as yourself. So I just want to tip my cap to you again on that, man. I've been following your work for 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 years now, and you've been one of the best, most consistent uh, investors in the crypto space. And so obviously with uh, with Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies getting a lot of attention recently, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to bring you back on the program, man. So just thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, super happy to be here. Uh, I think we're going to have a have, have a great riff and uh, kind of dive in uh, some of the analytics and some of the stuff that you don't really see on uh, the mainstream or the CNBCs of the world. I love that, man. So uh, before we even get into everything, uh, talk to me about So you've had a little bit of a career pivot since the last time we had on. Uh, you were obviously a land analyst at uh, BTC Inc. Uh, you uh, you pivot to the uh, buy side uh, side of the equation there at UTXO Management. So uh, talk to me about what you guys are doing over there, your role, and how you guys manage risk. Yeah, UTXO, um, we're, we're a liquid hedge fund. We also have the VC arm. Um, the thesis is that you know Bitcoin uh, is you know one of the biggest ideas, if not the biggest idea of our time. It's this hundred trillion dollar idea, and um, you know, they they started the firm in twenty nineteen. Uh, I joined in twenty twenty one. Um, and, you know, we're, we're riding this Bitcoin cycle. Um, a UTXO is an unspent Bitcoin transaction in technical nerd terms. Yep. Uh, and, and they also have a, the, the kind of a, under that umbrella is 210K capital. 210K, there's 210,000 Bitcoin blocks in one halving cycle. Yep. Um, so a lot of the stuff we do, um, it's kind of like a, a nod of the cap to the Bitcoin UTXO set, the Bitcoin uh, network, the Bitcoin system. And we, we dive really, really deep into Bitcoin analytics. So, so we're, I mean, we're, long and strong here um, but we're, we're long short where we get into the you know pu public equities um, we, we really really were heavy uh, into the GBTC trade uh, in late 2022 uh, and early 2023 as an activist trade um, so yeah I mean we're, we're Bitcoin focused uh, but kind of we, uh, we we like to keep it keep it flexible and, and shake it up and, and we've been performing really well I love it, man. So, so much of um, what's happened in the hedge fund space uh, throughout the, my career, for most of my career in Global Wall Street, you've seen uh, assets under management increasingly concentrated into the market neutral uh, platform shops, and they have a better, a great, they have a great product to offer to their, their investors. But the reality is, the old school hedge fund of trying to figure out ideas and, and, and risk managing those ideas and really being able to you know flex your, your gross exposure, your net exposure in material ways that just doesn't really exist anymore. Certainly not. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of where the flows have been in recent years, so I just want to say I, I'm grateful that firms like yours, with those thoughtful people like you, are, are springing up, and there's market demand for that kind, that kind of product. So if you're listening out there, if you're an investor, an accredited investor, uh, definitely uh, reach out uh, to myself or to Dylan, and we can get you in contact if you want some exposure uh, to this asset class because they're doing a great job for their investors over uh, UTXO. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, let's get into this, man. So. Uh, uh, I, I don't think it, it's not going to take much to assume that you're bullish. Uh, most people are bullish in this asset class, but obviously you have a very deep dive and thoughtful framework for how to think about managing risk uh, in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency. So I'll give you the floor to kind of let, you know, set the stage for your 30,000 foot view into the asset class and we can drill down from there. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, you know, deep down, our, our thesis is that Bitcoin is the asset, a lot of the crypto ecosystem, although, you know, at times it's beta to Bitcoin is mostly just noise. It's zero sum, negative sum liquidity games. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we pay attention, like for instance, Darius, the first time we met, I think it was March, 2022, yeah. you know, a couple months later, Luna, UST, Ponzi imploded, yeah. market sold 100,000 Bitcoin, Bitcoin's exchange rate got cut in half again, right? So like we, we pay attention to the crypto ecosystem, of course we do, but we're very much uh, dialed into Bitcoin. And the thesis that we've hammered home is that this is, you know, somewhat of a, of a singularity, like what would it look like if a global money monetized from scratch? Um, and I think everyone should ask that question, regardless of your opinion or exposure to Bitcoin. Um, so, I mean, in 2023, in the, you know, post FTX collapse, a lot of people but once again, Bitcoin was dead, right? And we'll show this in the in the an analytics going forward. But Bitcoin is dead. You know, it's SBF is a fraud. We knew, uh, you know, this thing is a Ponzi all along. And then, you know, it comes out that BlackRock is applying for an ETF. And you look at their track record, and it's 570 to one. The only ETF they've ever been denied is one that wasn't transparent, right? So it was a sure go that okay, 
you know, the big boys actually want exposure to this asset because, you know, Larry Fink isn't an ideological Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, his investors want Bitcoin exposure. It's very clear, right? And, and GPTC, you know, disclosure of which we were very much long and strong in uh, 2022 and 23 at a 50% discount to net asset value, um, you know, at, at nine, 10 bucks a share, uh, that like, that was a, a terrible product because it's only a one-way redemption with a, with a 2% fee, right? An ETF is, is very much a different product. So w with that signal, you know, Bitcoin's kind of in the 20s, 30s, thousands, it, it's climbed. ETFs go live in January 10th. And it is, you know, full disclosure, blown away I, just from the start. I mean, we are obviously extremely long-term bullish on this asset class, or really the, this asset, Bitcoin. Uh, but the ETFs have, have blown us out of the water in terms of the, the immediate success right out of the gate. By basically any metric you look at, I mean, if you're just looking at IBIT, the most successful ETF launch in history, right? There's 50 billion, 15 billion in AUM in the first two months. Wow. Uh, so, and, and this is with, right? If you look at the history, uh, the last 20 years of ETF outflows, GBTC is the second most outflows of an ETF ever in two ever. months, ever. And that their AUM in dollar terms is flat. 27 billion, 28 billion today. And look at the outflows of GBTC every single day, right? This is because Bitcoin is pumped. But this is because of the indiscriminate demand from BlackRock, Fidelity, and institutional investors. And really, from what we're hearing with all of the, the ETF issuers, like the Bitwises of the world, is the people that are the, the buyers of the Bitcoin ETF today actually aren't some of the biggest shops, aren't some of the, the, the big, big, big money pools of capital, but more so some of the family offices and hedge fund speculators um, that don't really need to uh, kind of wait for that uh, mark of approval. So we're actually expecting a continued wave of, of new demand into Bitcoin, into these ETFs. Um, and especially just given, you know, kind of the competitive FOMO nature of Wall Street, right? Like IBIT is 25% is above its volume weighted price, right? So, so if you have a Bitcoin, if you have Bitcoin exposure, right? Like this was the biggest, most obvious event driven trade we've seen in quite a while, irregardless of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. In 2022, Darius, a, a long, actually the presentation today is going to be very much similar to the one back then. The conditions have just completely flipped. We've done, we've had two years of an unbelievable accumulation in Bitcoin, and we see this time and time and time again, right? So the hodlers and the ideological maximalists, which people say, you know, Bitcoin is a cult. Bitcoin is these these Bitcoiners are crazy on Twitter, right? And we have fun, we have fun, uh, you know, memeing and but. PSO is the stock market, by the way. <laughs> it's just different people, different cohorts of investors. Of course, right? But but this absolute scarcity of Bitcoin and the supply and elasticity of the asset and the ideological, even if you want to say cult-like demand from these global cohort of investors is what primes the asset to trade irrationally and in a bubble, right? And so for 2022 and 2023, the price collapses 70, 80%. We see the, the biggest accumulation in the history of Bitcoin. 70% of Bitcoin haven't moved in a year. Right now it's 67%. So the supply side was primed. All we need was the, and we continued to hammer this home with UTXO publicly on Twitter, went out on CNBC and Fox Business saying, the supply side is primed. All we need is the macro story and the flows to turn. And this thing is going to fly like nothing else on the planet. And so the most successful ETF launches launch in history has served as that catalyst, right? Um, so if you want to go to, to chart two, or we can maybe go to chart one. Yep. Um, I got it up. Colin Quito, chart one. Uh, chart ones, that's ETF inflows. If you want to go to chart two here, uh, this is a uh, just Bitcoin hodl waves. This, so this is just showing how much Bitcoin has been held for what period of time. Purple is 10 years and it goes all the way down. This is Bitcoin held for one year or more, right? So 67% of Bitcoin, despite all time highs, haven't moved in a year. If you looked at it in November of 2023, right? All-time high amount of Bitcoin have never haven't moved in over a year. That was a year after the FTX collapsed. So the second biggest exchange in the world collapsed. Holders go, I don't care. I'm buying more, right? <laughs> and, and so this is what actually, and you see this time and time again. Do you see how this draws down into parabolic bull markets? Yep. What's happening here is just a supply-demand imbalance, and we do it time and time again, and we rinse and we repeat and we bubble, 
And on a linear chart, Bitcoin always looks like it's a bubble or a bust. And, and we just kind of continue this cycle of, of distribution and accumulation. So if we want to go to chart number three here, um, it's a similar chart. This is long-term and short-term holder supply. I'm just showing long-term holders, yeah. right? And if we want to actually go to chart four, I'll, I'll explain what a long-term holder is. Um, oh, I guess, uh, if, could you refresh the, um, the uh, slide deck if possible? I, uh, I added a oh. slide. Not, no worries, but uh, we can. Um, That's why we have technology, my friend. I'm going to do it in real time. Keep going. Sweet. Um, so if, if we're looking at the, the quantification of a long-term holder, we don't have to get too much into the definition, but essentially the longer a Bitcoin is held, the less likely it's, it's going to be spent in the future, right? So if it's held for a year, it's, it's, it's going to be less likely to be spent if it's held for another year, right? And so that long-term holder threshold is about 155 days. We found that to be statistically significant for a point where, hey, it's held for about six months. This person's pretty much, you know, unlikely to sell relative to coins that continue to flip week after week. And so this is this is Glassnode. Their data scientists did this. But if we look at at the long term holder supply, we can see every every bull market is is started or primed from a, a you know a devastating bear market of accumulation, indiscriminate, price agnostic accumulation. That's the story, right? So that this is the what you're looking at now is the the quantification of those long term holders. So the top the top chart is is the UTXOs, how likely they are to be spent. Yep. And then the bottom is, is, you know, kind of the, the shift from a long and short term holder. That's more noise, more just kind of give you um, some, some uh, context on what I'm talking about here. But if we go to chart three again, it's very, it's very much clear. And you can see even the losses, right, that, that the lighter blue is when long term holders are in a loss, right? So look at after the FTX collapse, 50% yeah. of the money in these coins that haven't moved in over six months, we're in a loss and guess what? No one sold, right? The coins literally didn't move. And this is also counting, I have some coins in cold storage. I want to move them to a new wallet, right? I'm not selling, I'm not putting them on the market, but even this metric shows that as a, as a, as a, a spend, as a sell, right? So this is not even talking just sell volume. This is just coins that haven't moved or stagnant. And people say this is a, a you know, a bearish thing and no one's using Bitcoin as money. They completely misunderstand what's happening. Um, so I'm going to introduce, is this normal, by the way? This seems—I mean, this pattern seems uh, pretty consistent over time. Is it uh, getting more or less exacerbated? Yeah, I mean, it's—it's it's very much interesting because the 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 second top of the 2021 cycle, from an on-chain standpoint, was was pretty abnormal, right? There wasn't a lot of actual of spending of coins, and then and we can attribute that obviously hindsight's 2020, but we attribute that to the FTX fraud essentially. Um, you know, there wasn't actually the on-chain, the on-chain footprint, just the UTXO set data kind of said that the top was the first half of 2021, you know, the $60,000 top when Coinbase IPO in April, that was the on-chain top more so. And the second 69K all-time high in, in November or whatever it was, was very much uh, driven by, you know, obfuscated leverage and, and hindsight fraud, right? So, but this is this pattern of accumulation and distribution is continuing. Um, and I think this is going to continue to prime the bull and bear cycles. And guess what? Like I'm not spending my Bitcoin at 70,000. I have no interest in selling. If it goes to, you know, some area in six figures, will I peel 5% off? Sure. Right. And that's, and that's very much what every single Bitcoiner is saying. I'm not selling to Larry Fink at 70,000, pump it to 150,000 and maybe I peel some off. Right. And, and that's, that's not just like this, this year, that's not just this go around. We see that in the data in 2011, in 2013, in 2017, and 2021. So this is this is not a new story whatsoever. It's just new actors. Um, well, so uh, you, uh, a lot to unpack there. So in terms of um, the new actors, just anecdotally from my own you know discussions with our institutional clients uh, on the Proto Pro side, you know I would say there's sort of like two camps. Well, it might be three camps. Well, one camp is like, all right, we're fully, we're ready, we're along this thing. You know, let's let's giddy up. We can be we can be longer than our PA or whatever. There's the other camp. It's like, OK, what's this? You know, is this really is this thing really have legs? Uh, and then there's the camp of uh, we can't trade this because of compliance. <laughs> and so uh, and you, you, you made a comment earlier that, you know, there's still uh, some institutional man likely to come into the asset class, in my opinion, particularly if we remain in a risk on market regime then uh, very much uh, that those are those those investors who have not yet been able to participate are obviously going to be beating down their doors of their compliance officers to say, hey, what, what is this? Let me get involved in this asset class. So we definitely agree with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they will be buying higher. Uh, that's that's 
that's the story. But um, if we want to go to chart five here, yep. this is realized cap. And I think this is a really important um, metric to understand. So market cap is obviously uh, an understood metric. Circulating supply of a stock, you know, float times the price. Pretty simple. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin's market cap is very much a bubble bust. You know, looking at it again in a linear chart, it's always confounding, right? That's why the skeptics are always screaming, like, I told you so, or this is irrational, right? Yeah. You look at the realized cap. Realized cap is taking every Bitcoin that's ever transacted on chain and valuing it at the price it transacted. So Satoshi Nakamoto, no one knows who he is, the, the founder of Bitcoin. He, she, they, them, no one knows. Open source software. He has a million, uh, around a million coins that were mined when before Bitcoin had an exchange rate, before it had any value assigned to it, they've never moved. The coins have never left the wallet. They're presumably lost. I would say that they're never, they're never going to move. Yep. They're valued in the realized cap metric at zero dollars. So it's wow. essentially like saying, hey, here's Apple stock. If we had a, a mutable ledger of Apple stock and we could see when you sell a new brokerage and when someone else buys, I know that's not how it works, but just hypothetically, we could say, well, hey, Apple stock's $2 trillion, but you know, Warren Buffett bought those shares uh, at a you know, $500 billion market cap, so those are valued there, right? And we can assign a price for every single Bitcoin that has ever transacted on chain, right? So market cap, circulating supply times, times price. Realized cap, circulating su supply of 20 million, 19 and a half million Bitcoin at the price they've all moved, right? And you see here, this is a logarithmic chart. Right? The chart starts at $50 million, it's, a, it's around $500 billion today. This is a log chart of just lockstep up and to the right on almost no volatility. Wow. Right? So, so you're looking at, oh, you know, this is so volatile, I can't touch this. And what you're missing is that this is a new decentralized monetary asset monetizing from scratch. The exchange rate vol, of course, there's derivatives, there's liquidations, there's fraud in every bubble. Of course there is. I, I, I was, if you followed me in 2022, I was the biggest skeptic of the bucket shop exchanges, of the yield services, and of the bad actors. SBF, 100% of fraud, right? Anybody yep. that's offering you yield on your Bitcoin, Bitcoin has no native yield, they are taking risk that you shouldn't take. You're selling, you're selling a tail that you're likely to get, you know, get blown up, yep. right? So, but on a long scale, this is very clear what's happening. So um, if we want to go to uh, chart number seven, here is, is the Bitcoin drawdown below the realized cap. So this is the actual mark to market exchange rate. You can, you can do both realized market cap or the realized price. It's mm -hmm. the same metric, right? The realized price would just be the, the average price that UTXOs have moved instead of the aggregate. Yep. Here's the Bitcoin market cap or the Bitcoin price drawing below its realized cap, right? So every bear market, we get this massive capitulation, you know, FTX collapsed or in, in in 20, you know, 2020, uh, 2019, it was, you know, post ICO bubbles and Bitcoin crashed to 3000 and it died. And the previous cycle, it died at 300. Right. Um, and, and really this is, is just, you know, kind of an irrational emotional reaction to the, you know, euphoria of a bull market. It's the, it's kind of the opposite forces at play. Um, so once again, in 2022, we Bitcoin drew down below, its average cost basis, right? The average cost basis of Bitcoin was like 19,000. It traded to 15,500, right? So that was priced incorrectly. It was almost like a discount. It's like, hey, people have put in, you know, uh, $300 billion or $400 billion into this asset and it's it's worth 350? Like that makes no sense, right? This is what this chart is showing, right? Um, if we want to go to chart number eight, Actually, one quick thing I'm, I'm noticing here in this chart, I mean, obviously, there's only three data points, so we can't make too many uh, hard conclusions. But obviously, the size of the drawdowns are uh, generally decaying over time, which implies yeah. more liquidity in the asset class. Uh, there's more price discovery in the asset class, which ultimately means it's becoming more of an institutionalized asset class, although it might not be there yet. Yeah, it's much these these bull, these wild bull market cycles are getting tamed ever so slightly. Right. There's still. Yep. There's still really crazy ball, and and you know, interestingly enough, there's some you know kind of new implied ball metrics um, that use you know options data. Bitcoin is kind of one of the not the only assets, and I, I, you know other assets do this from time to time, but it's I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you know Nvidia and Tesla have, have gamma squeezed hard, but okay. it's one of the unique assets that regularly in a bull market pumps with implied volatility, and right. I, I, I and I know this is you know real we're talking about realized vol versus implied vol. But if you look at, say, BVIV, Bitcoin Implied Volatility Index, 
Mm-hmm. Bitcoin implied vol has doubled in the last two months as prices ripped, right? When's the last time you saw the S&P 500 double, I mean, or not double, but pump aggressively with the VIX doubling? You don't see that, right? So this is- so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, quick question, or not quick question, just quick comment. Uh, you mentioned something I think is really important to share, and I think the average investor must understand this uh, if they're going to uh, add Bitcoin to a TradFi, you know, traditional multi-asset portfolio. Bitcoin tends to be positively correlated to both its historical volatility and its implied volatility. You know, one of the things we do when we built our uh, volatility adjusted momentum signal, which uh, uh, sort of scores volatility relative to price to determine if an asset is actually bullish or bearish or, or neutral. You know, one of the things we built into that system is determining is a, is a mathematical equation that determines whether or not price and volatility are positively or negatively correlated. The, the assumption is that, you know, price goes up, vol, or sorry, price goes up, vol goes down and vice versa, because that's people's experience generally with the equity and fixed income markets, which are the dominant trap by asset classes. But when you think about this from a multi-asset context, currencies uh, tend to, you know, the dollar tends to be positively correlated with volatility, cryptocurrencies, and most commodities tend to be positively correlated to volatility. And then we also see this uh, in various high-flying tech factors and tech stocks. And so this is something that, in our opinion, has allowed us to stay on the right side of market risk because we are understanding that whereas most institutional risk management processes will see higher volatility and tell you to take down your position size from a VAR perspective, from a GMB perspective, our model is saying, hey, no, this is actually a good thing. This is a bullish thing. You know, stay long on this asset. Love it. Yeah. I mean, just looking at the the signals, it looks pretty on the money. Um, yeah, thank you, man. Um, and, and, you know, just looking at risk adjusted returns, if you, if you are, you know, one that's worried about volatility, you can one, obviously this size your position accordingly. Um, I I'm young. I wouldn't advise my parents retirement portfolio to have a similar, you know, relative Bitcoin allocation. Of course not. Right. Um, but, the, from a risk adjusted return standpoint, you know, what's Bitcoin's the best performing asset this year was last year. And, yep. and all that volatility is a price you pay for, for returns, right? So I, I like this is one of the things that I often kind of laugh at is, you know, people will go, well, you know, congrats, Bitcoiners. It's now at the price it was three years ago, you know, 69,000. It's like at 72 or 73 today. It's like, well, you're, you're just picking, you're just picking this mark to market exchange rate that traded there for half a second but if if you at the worst time literally ever if you were the worst bitcoin investor ever um sorry about that um if you were the worst if you were the worst time bitcoin buyer ever and you started automated purchases at sixty nine thousand, and you bought from 69 to 15 back to today every day ten dollar chunk thousand dollar chunk it doesn't matter and excluding fees, you know, I guess you could do the math on a 1% fee or whatever it may be. You'd be up today, 140%. <laughs> so the people that are, like, you know, kind of self owning you like, look, Oh, you know, congrats. Or like, I, cause I, I was hammering this home at 30,000. It was like, if you, if you started buying Bitcoin at the worst time ever and are bought, buying today, it's still 50% down from its highs. You've outperformed stocks, you know, S and P 500, NASDAQ gold bonds. Right. So, so the volatility is something that you should embrace, right? And I jokingly say, like, my dumbest friend has outperformed the smartest hedge fund manager I know. Right? <laughs> Buys every week with his paycheck. Um, yep. So if we want to take a look here, I think this is a really great look at Bitcoin's monetization bubbles. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm fully expecting at some point in the next uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, this thing to become very much overheated and get into bubble territory as is tradition. But if we want to go to, to chart number 10 here, um, um, or we can do let's i'm sorry chart nine would be great yep. um so i just sh- i showed you market uh the the realized cap right and i showed you in log scale um, and i compared it to market cap right so here we have what's called the market value market value to realized value ratio mvrv this is just a ratio of the market cap to the realized cap right so the market market cap circulating supply times price realized cap is just the price of all Bitcoin where they moved in aggregate, right? So it's just valuing, the, it's like a much more precise market cap uh, indicator, right? And, and what we have with this ratio is we can see these monetization bubbles happening in real time, right? Yeah. And, and, and as the Bitcoin price jumps, right? And the people that bought at 10,000 or 5,000 or 1,000 and they spend, right? And they and maybe they sell on Coinbase, 
what's happening is, is you can think of this as a capital inflow, right? Someone that bought at 1,000 is now exchanging out for someone that's coming in at 70, right? That there's, there's now, I guess you can think of it as like $69,000 of new capital coming in, right? And, buy, and, and, and being pumped into the network. And okay. so this market value to realize value ratio is like, is almost this pure signal, right? And if we go to number 10, we're going to slap a Z-score on here. Uh, ratio, yeah. This is a ratio between the difference in market cap and realized cap and the standard deviation of market cap. Don't need to get you know into the technical weeds here, but we can very much see these monetization bubbles happening with absolute clarity, right? And what you have during these cycles, like if you look at 2017, for instance, there was multiple 20, 30, 40, you know, 30% pullbacks. But at the, and, and you know, on, a, on this kind of, if you look at this as like a valuation, it got cheaper during this moment because the realized cap was still climbing and the market cap, as the market cap was, was falling, new money was being pumped mm -hmm. into, into the system. So here we are at the highs, right? You know, this is where Bitcoin was trading in April of 2021, higher than it is. But relative to where realized cap is, where, you know, the aggregate value of all these coins were bought, Bitcoin's cheaper, right? So this is kind of this like cyclical oscillator between Bitcoin's dead and Bitcoin's massive bubble. And guess what? It's going to do it again and again and again. And at some point, like Bitcoin's going to be worth trillions and trillions of dollars. And you're still people are still going to be looking at linear charts and saying, haha, I told you so. I knew it would dip 30 percent. So it's it's kind of funny that we're doing this. And, and, you know, in 2022, we were posting this and we were shouting from the rooftops like, look, yes, global macro is kind of a, you know, kind of a mess right now. We, there's a lot of uncertainty. We're in the fastest rate, rate uh, hike cycle ever. Like we don't know what's on the horizon, but Bitcoin's trading at fire sale levels. Um, and so I, I sort of suspect this happens again. I mean, I don't know if it, you know, if it uh, reaches the absolute fire sale levels we got post 2022, but I could, I could very much imagine a scenario where we collapse 60% again from whatever the Pico top exchange rate level was, right? And that's going to wash a whole lot of people out and we're going to see kind of these fire sale capitulations. But before that, I think we get somewhat of a, a you know, another one of these, as I refer to them as monetization bubbles. I love it, man. This is uh, this is fantastic analysis, man. So my first question uh, to you was uh, when I saw this first chart, I was saying, OK, we're seeing a series of lower highs in terms of this uh, market value to realize value ratio. But then you sort of answered my question here with the next chart, uh, which is a Z-score chart. Is this Z-score calculated based on the entire population, the entire look back sample on the chart? Or is it on a trailing sample of, of, of data? Which would make it, in my opinion, a little bit more um, uh, more forward looking of analysis. Um, I don't quote me on this, but I believe it's it's the the entire data set. Um, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, uh, so it's, it's going to be hard for if it's the entire data set. It's going to be hard for uh, something in this particular cycle, in my opinion, to get back up into that zone. But even if it's not, then we're talking about you know you have multiples. You're basically have, if it, if it is a trailing sample in terms of the Z score, which makes more sense. Um, if it is a trailing sample that you're talking about, we're probably only halfway done with this, this pump at, at most. And, and, and it's also not linear, right? This, yeah. if, if, if we want to go, if we want to look at, uh, uh, chart number six, I, I kind of just looked at, uh, you know, when Bitcoin broke the highs and I posted this the other day, mm -hmm. you know, the last, the last three or four times Bitcoin has broken a, a high on a multi-year time frame, it doubled in 18 days, 80 days, 18 days, and 10 days. Um, th this is log scale, right? So I'm not saying Bitcoin's a, a, you know, a sure bet to go to 150K by X date. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when you're looking at a linear scale and you, and you have this, this you know, supply that's so, so primed and this global FOMO that's happening, right? Like everybody that's ever looked at this thing could have bought it, closed their eyes, and they'd be in, in the money, right? And so there's this, this immense... FOMO and like again, I'm I'm not trying to, you know, FOMO anyone into this. Do your own due diligence. But I'm saying, you know, this is empirically happening, um, and it's it's happened multiple times before, right? And the perceptions, and you know, I, I like to, um, you know, not my favorite person in the world, but brilliant uh, market, you know, uh, you know, a, a market wizard, George Soros, his theory of reflexivity, the the perception and the fundamentals operate in a feedback loop where the liquidity of this asset, the recognition of this asset, the education of the asset, and actually the physical and te technical infrastructure of this asset improve as price bubbles up. So when, when the price ripped from 1,000 to 20,000 in 2017, 
it's not just like this intangible digital you know unit on a screen that's going up there's a massive profit incentive to arbitrage in the energy markets because mining bitcoin is this digital gold rush so you have billions and billions and billions of dollars of capex that's that's you know basically going anywhere in the world where energy is free or cheap and and this is waste gas this is in, in the texas ERCOT grid anywhere where they can be a buyer of energy when no one wants it and a seller of energy when everybody wants it bitcoin miners are going there and so bitcoin bubbling to whatever a rational price target you want to you know throw on a dartboard is is irrelevant to the long-term picture and the long-term picture is as this as we see these monetization bubbles the physical infrastructure like the the bitcoin miners but also wallet technology exchange liquidity education wallets custody solutions institutional onboarding improves right and this is happening it's like it's it's just empirically it, it is happening um so the 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 perception of the asset and the fundamentals in a bull market feed back on each other in a reflexive in a reflexive feedback loop um and so this is why you know like kind of these you know price targets and like you know where do you expect bitcoin to be in a year like i, I used to kind of throw those out and i just don't anymore because it's like, look, you're, 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 this is, this is like human nature on, you know, coming, coming. And it's like this, I, I would, I describe it as a singularity, honestly, this is a monetary singularity and, and you can deny that it's happening if you want. Um, but again, look at the log scale here, right? People have been saying Bitcoin has died or is dying or is irrelevant for a decade, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then and and though <laughs> some of those people are now dead, unfortunately, um, that yeah, is what so, it is. So yeah, um, let's see. Um, what's oh, one quick, of the one quick thing? You said something that really uh, is pretty funny to me that I think is uh, is worthy of, 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 of backing. You said you're not trying to FOMO people into this asset class, but I would argue I would love to FOMO people into this asset class. You know, we built our Kiss portfolio construction process specifically for serious. Tradify investors with multi-asset portfolios, either their own retirement portfolio or their clients' retirement portfolios to help them gain exposure uh, to Bitcoin and more importantly, uh, reduce their exposure to you know legacy uh, legacy strategies like 6040. Uh, and right now, and, and we have been for a while, uh, that, 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 that strategy has been max long its exposure to Bitcoin. So it's a 60, 30, 10 trend following approach. It uses our, uh, our global macro risk matrix and our volatility adjusted momentum signal to infuse uh, volatility targeting dynamic position sizing uh, into, that, into that strategy. And right now we are currently max long Bitcoin, 100% of our max exposure, 10% for max long stocks, 60% or 100% of our max exposure, 60%. And then we got 15% uh, exposure in, in, in ag uh, in the fixed income market and in the other 15% uh, that would otherwise be in ag is now just collecting five five plus percent on the short end of the treasury curve because the, the, the dynamic position sizing signal for ag is, is not there yet. So, you know, what we try to do at 42 Macro is, is less about the, um, you know, less about in terms of how we help investors make money and protect gains in financial markets. You know, I think we have some of the best qualitative fundamental research in the world, we wouldn't have a, a thriving institutional uh, risk management business if we did not. But in my opinion, I think one of the things that we do best is help investors make money and protect gains in financial markets. And the system's obviously done a great job uh, in terms of helping investors make money and protect gains. And it's not because uh, of our fundamental views on Bitcoin or respectfully into your research or our view that Bitcoin is a singularity or uh, it's going to devour all their currencies, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I probably am some, some firm of a Bitcoin maximalist, maximalist, but that doesn't infuse its way into our risk management systems. The only signals that refuse their way into the risk management systems are what market regime are we in and what's the volatility adjusted momentum signal for that particular asset. And obviously it's been bullish uh, for Bitcoin uh, for quite a while. And that's why, in our opinion, this, this system has, has done quite well for, for our clients over the past uh, year or so. Yeah, love it. And, and, and likewise, I mean, I, maybe some of that stuff sounds dogmatic. Uh, I mean, at UTXO, we very much, uh, we, have, we have some quant systems implemented and, and we you know, we like to look at the analytics rather than, you know, get emotional about things. Sorry. Um, yeah. And by the way, I wasn't trying to say that there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying, I think, the, you know, for people who are managing multi-asset portfolios that 
probably cannot uh, accept the same level of volatility as a crypto native portfolio or a portfolio of someone who's much younger that can have much higher exposure to crypto. You know, we try to build portfolios for people who are either at or near retirement or they have clients that are at or near retirement and it helps them uh, manage risk and, and sleep comfortably at night, even though they have such a high volatility, high beta exposure in their portfolio. Sorry, I didn't mean to clarify that. No, no, love it. Um, and just do, is it a hard cutoff at? Uh, no, no, we can go. We can go, man. Absolutely. Let's keep it going. All right, sweet. Um, OK, so let's go to uh, 11 here. Um, yep. So this is this is building on the realized uh, price and cap metrics that we were talking about. Again, realized cap, we're talking about the price of all Bitcoin at, at where they moved. Um, so here is Bitcoin price in, uh, you know, the kind of the, the red, yellow and green at the top. The, the dark blue black is the realized cap. And yep. the bottom pane is a 30 day rate of change of the realized cap. So you can think of that 30 day rate of change of the realized cap as inflows when it's positive or outflows when it's negative yep. coming into the Bitcoin asset. Again, we're, we're monitoring what's that, that, that all of the aggregate level of all of the Bitcoin at the price they've last moved. What's the rate of change of that? And when you when you see an extremely high positive rate of change above, you know, we say above 10 percent on a 30 day basis, that's a bull market. And when you see negative, when you see negative readings for this, that's a bear market, meaning how could it be negative? How could this metric be negative? It's negative when the realized cap is declining. Well, how, why is the realized cap declining? Well, because some guy, you know, that doesn't really understand what he owns, bought Bitcoin at 60,000 because he saw the number going up and he sold it at 20,000 because he got scared and, and capitulated. So there was a, a $40,000 decline in realized cap if he sold one Bitcoin at those price levels, right? So, so this, we, we've, we're kind of washing out and, and repeating the cycle over and over again. And just now we're, we're kind of seeing this play out. So, um, you know, if we want to just look at 19, this is, I'll just take 10 seconds on this chart. Take your time, man. We're this is realized cap. Same thing we looked at in the first, first two slides in linear terms, right? So would you short this price chart? If this was a, it would, if this was a tech stock, would you short this thing? No, you, you'd be, you know, you'd be scrapped in a second, right? So this is, again, in a log, log scale is showing what's actually happening. But on a linear scale, we're breaking out in a multi-year time frame. And guess what? Like, this is nothing new. Do not short this thing because there's billions and billions of dollars of inflows. And we can see the inflows, never mind the fact that BlackRock is, is posting every night at 8 p.m. Hey, we bought 800 million more of Bitcoin. We can see it happening on chain, right? Like, we can see in the UTXO state data, using the price we can see oh well, yeah coins that were accumulated in 2015 hey you know a small amount of those just moved right and they went to coinbase we can see that um and that's the beauty of bitcoin and that's the beauty of an immutable ledger and you can't really do this with any other asset you can't do it with bonds you can't do it with gold you can do it with bitcoin um so i'll do uh i'll, I'll do a couple more things here um i want to touch on the derivatives market um because yes, this please. is uh, uh we'll go to 14. Yep, um the structure of the Bitcoin derivatives market has fundamentally shifted in a massive, massive way. And there's big implications. Um, so in 2020, the bull cycle was driven on a few things. One was MicroStrategy. They bought you know, 100,000 plus Bitcoin. But the second was GBTC and the arbitrage trade, right? GBTC closed end, closed end trust that traded at a premium. You had hedge funds, shops come in, uh, yield services that would bring $100 of Bitcoin, they would receive $120 back of locked GBTC for six months. That was trading at a 20% premium or whatever the numbers were. And they would mark up their books. And, and maybe they shorted Bitcoin on the other side. Maybe they didn't. But that 20% premium, they got that. They marked their books up in a day. But it was locked for six months. So mm -hmm. that, that trade, that, that basically that carry trade, bought 300, 400,000 Bitcoin in the span of about 18 months. Wow. Um, so what, what this did is, and that GBTC premium, it actually fueled the, the yield complex of crypto, if you will. There was the GBTC premium was what BlockFi and a lot of the now defunct Celsius, they all were offering yield services based on the idea that they could sell that GBTC at a, at a premium um, because they bought it and, and you know, they had that six month window uh, where they could, it was locked. And so once that G, the GBTC premium went to a discount for the first time ever, um, you know, more than just like an intraday thing in February of 2021, and, and it didn't trade back to net asset value until the ETF launch, right? Wow. So what, what this did is 600,000 Bitcoin of collateral 
derivative collateral in the form of GBTC that was traded at a premium that all of these yield complexes were built on now was at a discount and that started to unwind. So you had two bastions of the yield complex, GBTC and the futures leverage, right? So I'm going in, I'm longing my, my Bitcoin, uh, I'm, I'm taking my Bitcoin collateral, I'm logging onto Binance, I'm longing Bitcoin with Bitcoin collateral and I'm paying a 30% interest rate annualized to do it. And, wow. and this this was post all time high break post twenty twenty uh you know twenty thousand uh, dollars in December of twenty twenty this trade this this you know basically degenerate leverage trading exploded and the percent futures this is kind of a mouthful percent futures open interest that's crypto margin meaning the percent of open interest in the Bitcoin derivatives complex that was collateralized with crypto or Bitcoin itself was seventy percent. Meaning wow. that the, the convexity, like if I take Darius, if I take some Bitcoin and I go long Bitcoin with that collateral, my PL in Bitcoin terms is 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 asymptotic, but in USD terms, it's exponential. Of course. So my 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 PL is is up only and my collateral is also increasing in value. Great. But it also works the other way. I was gonna say that works in both directions. <laughs> Bitcoin goes down, my collateral collapses in value and my PL is going negative in red and I get margin call. So the, the unwind we saw post 2020 was the GBTC trade carry trade unwinding, but also the Bitcoin derivatives complex has completely shifted from crypto margin, ETH, Bitcoin, FTX, you could use FTT, their own printed Ponzi token as collateral to trade crypto futures. You could use Dogecoin, right? It was ridiculous, it was madness. And we washed it all out. So now, where what are we looking at? If you go to slide 15, CME futures is the largest it's ever been as a percent of this Bitcoin futures market, right? And what's CME futures? It's dollar collateral, it's treasuries collateral, it's low leverage, right? So it's not yeah. I'm logging into Bitmax or Binance or Bybit with 50x leverage punting along, right? These are institutional investors that essentially just you know either they want cash ex you know they want cash exposure. It's essentially a spot you know kind of trade for them or they want to capture the contango, right? Bitcoin 72,000, front month CME is trading at say, I don't know, 75 or 74 or whatever it is um, in a bull market because there's demand for to be long Bitcoin, right? Like 10% interest rate, that I'll take that, right? Like I'm actually really bullish on Bitcoin. My carry, if I say, if I wanted to sell my Bitcoin for dollar yield, I'm not doing it for a 5% yield. I'm not doing it for Fed funds. I'm not doing it for 10%. I'm not doing it maybe even for 15% because I'm not bullish. And this is a general consensus in Bitcoin or crypto broadly is look, your bond market's great. 10% cost of capital is nothing to me. And we've seen this. And so the CME futures rising as a USD margin instead of this kind of high flying crypto casinos of 2021 has changed the structure of the derivatives market. So instead of BTC collateral and the convexity and the kind of the juice that 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 convexity brings. It's now USD margin. So think of it this way. It's the inverse. Now, if you want to short Bitcoin, because for every long in the futures market, there's a short, you're shorting with dollar collateral. So in Bitcoin pumps, you now have your collateral declining in value in Bitcoin terms and your PL going down. Yeah. So so the the kind of explosive moves we see are because this derivatives complex is now USD margin instead of crypto margin. Because I can, for instance, if I have one BTC of collateral, I can short one BTC of the futures and never get margin called, yep. right? The synthetic dollar. But if I have one, if I have 72,000 of USD and I short Bitcoin, you can get margin called. Absolutely. So the, the structure of the derivatives market post 2021 has completely inversed, and it's a fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, thing to see for bulls. Um, yeah, I was going to say it seems like we went from a scenario where the leverage and the unwind of that leverage was going to create a uh, vicious, a uh, reflexive bear market, and now on this chart, it's suggesting that the unwind of any leverage will cause a reflexive bull market. Is that the proper um, assertion? Yeah, and, and of course, right, it, it can go both ways, and and you know we've seen like. Bitcoin trade at 69,000 briefly, flushed to 59,000 in two hours and recovered, right? And it's like, but every single one of these dips, 
you see on, on any, any sort of liquidation, you can look at the hour time frame daily, you know, you can look at minute candles if you want. The spot volumes and the, and the ETF volumes spike massively when you see these kind of liquidations. And it's mostly, there still is the, you know, the animal spirits, the crypto natives, you know, the people logging on to buy bit, there still is that of course, right? But relative to last bull market, that the investor profile has completely shifted from retail degenerate crypto, you know, casinos to institutions um, that are that are you know not trading at 10x leverage with Bitcoin collateral. They're USD collateral, maybe 2x leverage, right? So we're seeing. I think we're going to see a lot less of the 40% wipeouts, and maybe I eat my words here. But on the way up, I you know we're going to see these cleanses, but I think they're much more short lived, and they're not going to see that that kind of uh, you know, collateral spiral downwards that we saw as much as aggressively as, as we did previously. 100%, man. I Back in uh, October of 2020, I bought my first Bitcoin. Uh, that's when I became a, a Bitcoiner. Uh, and one of the things uh, I, I tweeted out at the time uh, to our audience then was, I think this asset class is going to get increasingly institutionalized over time. And, and one of the uh, dominant uh, features of, of is institutionalized asset classes is one, it becomes more correlated to uh, other risk assets. Uh, that's obviously something we saw both in 2022, 2023, and obviously here in 2024. And secondarily, the volatility across the full investing cycle of Bitcoin will continue to tone down. So if this was the, the cycles back in 2010, 2013, 2017, 2018, over time, you know, the, 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 the changes, the percentage changes will continue to tone down, even though we continue to make new highs and things like realized price uh, and actual and absolute prices uh, and continue to experience these, these raging bull markets. So in my opinion, I think it's all moving uh, in the direction of that, of that prognostication from, uh, from two and a half years ago, three and a half years ago. Uh, but more importantly, I think it continues to move in the direction that favors uh, investors to continue to take a look at this asset class. You know, we you know we've done a tremendous amount of research uh, on you know longer term structural economic dynamics uh, in the economy, and uh, particularly through the guise of uh, our fourth turning work, uh, which uh, you know I, I obviously learned and studied under my, my former colleague and, and one of my mentors, Neil Howe, who's uh, one of the co-authors of that entire framework. And 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 in doing that deep dive empirical study, uh, there's a few things that really stand out to me uh, that are very high probability outcomes. Uh, throughout the duration of this war turning, which uh, Neil believes may persist over the next decade or so. And the reality is uh, things, two of these things that favor Bitcoin most are the explosion of sovereign uh, fiscal debts and deficits, though that's a high probability event. And we always obviously saw that uh, COVID, in our opinion, was just a preview uh, to, that, to that, that, that kind of uh, that kind of dynamic. And then the response to that from fiscal uh, from monetary authorities, uh, which is financial repression and monetary debasement. Uh, that's something we are likely to see uh, in an in increasing size. So while the Bitcoin uh, uh, investment cycle uh, is doing this over time, the sort of monetary and fiscal policy cycles are doing the exact opposite over time, uh, which obviously should continue to insulate uh, inflows into the asset class over the long term. So uh, definitely check that out, that research out. Uh, we have that forth turning uh, work in the, in the appendix of all our monthly macro scout reports. If you haven't take, taken a look at that yet, I highly recommend you're definitely going to want to print that out uh, and keep it next to your desk for the next decade. 100%. And, and the macro thesis is something that is is core to our to, to my Bitcoin belief. Like I would, if you know, if debt to GDP wasn't 125% and it was 70%, I would still be bullish on Bitcoin because I think it's, you know, we have a superior engineered asset, absolute scarcity out of the whims of, pol of, of political hands, you know, with, that's, that's secured by proof of work hash rate, compute power tied directly to energy grids, right? Like it's a, it's a, this is a digital synthetic commodity. It's with gold. A, it's yeah, digital gold. Digital gold. It's a digital synthetic commodity with a marginal production cost that's programmatically going higher. Like if you understand what hash rate is, if you understand what the difficulty adjustment is, which which follows hash rate, wherever hash rate goes, it becomes harder and harder and harder to mine Bitcoin. Well, if you think of it, that means the marginal production cost per unit of Bitcoin is absolutely. continuing to climb. Yep. You have an absolutely scarce asset that's programmatically has a harder and a higher and higher production cost per unit, right? So regardless of the fiscal or the macro, I would be bullish Bitcoin, but, we also happen to live in a world where if we go to slide 21, we had the biggest inflation burst in 50 years and debt to GDP went nowhere, right? So if you looked at what the IMF said in 2011, if you looked at what they said in 2015, they said, well, we're in a sovereign debt bubble. The only way out, we can't explicitly default. They, sovereigns have explicitly defaulted 
time and time again throughout history. Sorry, we don't have your gold. Sorry, I know we owe you dollars, but here's our you know, inflated currency worth nothing. Sorry, yeah. the US, the EU, Japan, China, they're not going to explicitly default on their sovereign promises. It's not gonna happen. They have a money printer. What yeah. we're going through is a slow motion, implicit default on US, on, on global sovereign debt ob obligations. So we've already had, like, I, I've been a huge and vocal bond bear since 2020, right? I was screaming from the rooftop, you, you know, the smart money, quote unquote, is buying long dated fiat liabilities at 1.3%. Like, this is just unbelievably irrational pricing. This is, this is stupidness. The, the, the bull case is that the central bank buys them and pushes yields lower. This is r ridiculous. But so we've, we've seen the duration repricing, right? Long end yields have gone from 1% to 4%, 5%. Sure, right? We've seen the long end reprice. Okay, is the bond market over? Is this a great time to buy bonds? Well, maybe for a trade, I, I, I you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months, sure, right? You can get some real juice if yields go lower and you have a slowdown. But on a 10 year time frame, on a 20 year time frame, on a 30 year time frame, I'm a young guy, you're a young guy. I have zero interest, zero in holding the holding obligations of a sovereign nation, or even, I mean, I guess, depending on the yield from a corporate denominated in fiat currency terms, because the only way out of 130% debt to GDP is a default. And again, the default will not be explicit. It will be implicit, right? So the macro is so bearish. This is a, you know, got got to Lynn Alden. The macro is so bearish, it's bullish, right? Like I was actually um, in 2023, I was a bit uh, I was I was too macro bearish than I should have been. I was like, look, they've, they've hiked rates to the moon. They're going to, you know, we're seeing, the, you know, Powell's in his Volcker moment and they're going to try this austerity thing and it's going to end up really bad. You know, they're going to swing the pendulum too far and they're going to make a policy mistake. And I discounted the fact that from a fiscal standpoint, we were going to be running deficits at the strongest rate we've the U.S. has ever done outside of wartime or recession, right? We're just pumping money into the system with, with zero regard, right? And so in this world we're living in, you have to own something that's scarce. You have to own something with a, with a production cost. You can't save in fiat currencies or even the debt obligations of those fiat currencies on a long time frame. 5% short-term cash is fine, right? I'm, you know, I, I need a savings buffer. I need, you know, I'm, I'm indecisive. I don't know where I'm gonna put my money. But you're gonna buy a long, you're gonna buy a long bond and hold to maturity you're gonna lose everything, or maybe not everything, but you're gonna get pennies in return in real purchasing power terms. And that's what matters, right? So we've already got the, the, the duration repricing on the sovereign debt side. What you haven't seen is the sustained period of financial repression that's needed to get out of this. It's just math, right? Like if you look at what the CBO is saying, the Congressional Budget Office, they literally expect the, the deficit and the debt to GDP to continue to climb, to continue to explode, right? So policymakers are living in a world completely, you know, completely outside of the realm of logic, of rationale, and you know, this idea of austerity or fiscal discipline. It's the, the playbook that's thrown out, it's gone, right? Red team, blue team, I don't care who you vote for, but this is the world we're living in. And if you can't recognize it, you're going to be, you're going to be hurt, right? You're going, you have to insulate yourself. And if you, you know, choose to not like, if you choose to absolve from this and distance yourself and say, Hey, look, you know, I don't really, I don't really care about this stuff. Well, it cares about you. Right. So that's the thing. And, and, and you can't insulate yourself from this. You can't insulate yourself from this macro dynamic. Right. So like we're at the debt levels that we haven't seen since world war II, Right. And what followed that? Well, a sustained period of financial repression. hundred so, percent. So this is like, I, I didn't, I, we didn't talk much on the macro standpoint, this, this uh, uh, podcast or, or uh, interview, but I mean, the macro is core to this all, right? It's the, it's a realization that it's not a U.S. Like, I, I love the dollar milkshake theory. I'm a, I'm a big Brent Johnson fan. I think it's right. The U.S. is the best currency out of all fiats, but it's still going to devalue against everything you want to buy and own, right? It's just, it's a, it's an absolute certainty that perpetual credit expansion will exist and continue forever by definition of this system. They, they actually can't rewind it. They can't taper this off. Um, so in that world, what do you do? Um, and that's up to everyone. I mean, you can buy uh, you know, equity indices. You can try to get you know, high yield bonds and hope that you're an astute credit investor. You yeah. can maybe you know, buy commercial real estate or residential real estate and try to short the dollar. 
it buy gold, you know, it'll maintain its purchasing power. But I mean, for me, it's, it's Bitcoin. I've put all of my money in, in wealth into Bitcoin for five years going straight. And, you know, I've have eaten 80% drawdowns. I understand everybody's not comfortable with that, but that's, that's our thesis is that, look, there's no actually escaping this. Um, and it's just math. Like this is not dogmatic. This is not, you know, hopium. We're not pumping anything. This is the, this is the reality of the fiscal situation. The U.S. and every sovereign nation. Dylan, I'm, I'm glad that there are folks out there that uh, uh, call folks like you uh, charlatans and, and hopium purveyors and, and FOMO inducers and all that stuff, because it means there's folks on the sideline with a healthy degree of skepticism that are going to be forced to buy the, part, the price, price higher. Right. Like this is how you create sustained bull markets. So the bull markets end when those people all jump into the kiddie pool with us and there's no one left to buy. And so in our opinion, we definitely want to continue that healthy degree of skepticism out there. And we're so grateful for it because it's making us rich. Uh, before we wrap up, I, I got to draw something because whenever we talk about uh, long term economic dynamics, uh, I got to draw this, this, this diagram that uh, uh, one of the world's best uh, and most respected uh, macro minds on the buy side, he runs the macro uh, firm. I'm sorry, the macro fund at one of the most uh, oldest and well-respected firms on the buy side. And he drew this for me, I want to say in like 2011 or 2012. And, I, and I'll never get it out of my head because it's really reformulated how I thought about managing cycle risk. Uh, and it's this. This right here is the secular. You can say that's U.S. debts, U.S. deficits, inflation, uh, supply of fiat currency, uh, and the Bitcoin price chart. All those things are have a secular bull market over long term. Uh, based on uh, these sort of turning dynamics that we continue to see, which are obviously going to get uh, exacerbated by some of the demographic uh, challenges that we face uh, here in the U.S. and across a lot of developed worlds. But there's also the cyclical. The cyclical will go up and down along the way. And it's our job as investors to build risk management systems and or to build, you know, thoughtful, uh, qualitative frameworks that can tell us where are we on not just what, you know, not only is the is the arrow, the long, the big arrow pointed up or down, but where are we uh, in the cycles? And right now, if you think about where Bitcoin is in its cycle, it's probably somewhere, you know, here breaking back out past the previous all time high. It's probably got some place to go. And eventually some of those dynamics that are contributing to the up arrow being, uh, you know, 45 degree sloped uh, arrow to the right up and right will start to change at the margins that cause positioning to change. And once you see positioning change, you need to, if you want to manage risk in an asset class as volatile as Bitcoin, you need to have systems in place that will allow you to do that. So we're very proud of the systems that we build, our global macro risk matrix, our macro weather model. And obviously we have, in our opinion, some of the best uh, qualitative research on Wall Street that can help investors understand where they are uh, in those cycles. But the reality is, if you are a younger investor or a uh, more longer term hodler that you know can afford to uh, experience a significant drawdown, Oh, that's, you know, more power to you. We're all going to wind up in the same place, which is with a lot of Bitcoin and not a lot of fiat uh, 10, 15 years from now. But the reality is there's, uh, in our opinion, for those who might be closer to retirement or managing the money of people that are at or near retirement, you know, there's uh, there's ways to get around having to deal with some of the volatility of this asset class. So definitely check us out uh, if you want to uh, learn more about those strategies. So Dylan, yeah, before we wrap up, man, I got a couple of questions in the queue, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, so I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll drop the first one that says, uh, does Dylan have a view on Ethereum and Solana? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think in a bull market, they will rise with Bitcoin, right? Like someone said, well, why is Ethereum going up if it doesn't have an ETF? And I said, why why isn't Ethereum going up if, if Bitcoin doesn't rise, right? Like Bitcoin is is is, wag, is is kind of the dog and both of these things are the tail and they're 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 going along with it. Um, I got, you know, I don't have a particularly strong the thesis on any of the cryptos like like you know you can be bullish tesla stock you can be bullish on you know a software company or you know an ai startup i have you know zero problem with that um but i think like you're, you're confusing a company or a you know startup with like the rise of the internet right it's like yeah. could you buy a slice of the internet protocol no obviously not right but the people that realized where this was all going like Right. So I think that's that's how I compare it. I don't really have a, a, a too strong of a view, but if Bitcoin is going up, I have no doubt that these will you know, be trending. Absolutely. And then uh, the next question, the last question uh, says, uh, Dylan, do you have an approximate price target for this cycle peak? You kind of mentioned that you didn't, but in <laughs> ballpark. Yeah, I, I mean, I would doubles just, past the previous all time high. So the starting point is one hundred and forty thousand, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be extremely surprised if we didn't uh, reach that uh, you know, one hundred fifty thousand standpoint sometime 
in the next 12 months. Um, and I, I would be surprised uh, if we didn't get an irrational credit cycle. Like, like there's a, a native credit cycle in the real economy and the macro economy, and it's very much intertwined with Bitcoin. There is also a Bitcoin native credit cycle. There's yeah. there's collateralized Bitcoin loans. There's the 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 crypto margin. There is there there is a credit cycle in Bitcoin and the prices themselves. And there's a reflexive feedback loop. And so I think we've just started. But think about it: these fifteen billion dollar BlackRock ETFs are being used like the SPY QQQ. You know these stocks they're already being used as collateral in you know Goldman private lending, like or, or you know these like investment bank. You know, for high net worth individuals, you can you can pull down dollar dollar liquidity against your equity assets at Fed funds plus fifty bips, right? So so now the ETF is in that is in that category, and and who knows how much is that's going to happen? But there's assuredly going to be Bitcoin's own credit cycle. So I I mean I'm I'm uber bullish. Um, I don't have you know I I don't have price targets, and I I've been burned in the past. I thought we were going to hundred thousand in twenty twenty one. And then, you know, people clowned on me for like, ha you said this. And I was like, you know, I realized that I, I only have a, a strong directional trend and that that's up. I uh, appreciate that answer, man. It's a well, it's a astute answer uh, from someone who knows exactly what the hell they're doing. Uh, and Darius, can I, can I, I know we're a bit over time here, but can I just chime in Take on that. one last idea? Yeah, of course, of course. So I, this is what I think is the biggest idea. This is the biggest story in corporate finance and, and no one's talking about it outside of these Bitcoin circles. If we go to uh, slide 20. Slide 20. Uh, this is this company is called MicroStrategy, and I'm sure people know him, and I'm sure people have heard of Michael Saylor, um, but I, I don't think people actually understand what's going on. In in, in August of 2020, MicroStrategy, who tw 20 years after the dot com bubble, they drew, drew down 99 percent, recovered, are making 150 100 million dollars a year. They have 500 million in cash, 10 years of accumulated income, 1.5 billion dollar company, 500 million of cash. Wow. They say we're going on a Bitcoin standard. Buy 500 million of Bitcoin. Raise a convertible debt instrument. Buy more Bitcoin. Raise junk mark. The convertible debt, by the way, was zero percent interest rates due in 2027. Raise 600 million uh, of of senior secured notes. Junk junk debt. Six percent yield. Buy Bitcoin. Raise another convertible note. Issue equity. Issue equity. All the proceeds buy Bitcoin. Today, MicroStrategy is a 32 billion dollar company with 15 billion dollars of Bitcoin on its balance sheet. Right. So the FASB accounting rules for Bitcoin have changed, right? I understand there's a lot of vol, right? Like, like if you look at the, the daily wicks for this stuff, it's heavily shorted. It's insane implied volatility. I'm not, I'm not pitching micro strategy. Like, no, no, that's not what I'm doing. But people dismissed it as sailor being a maximalist zealot, being, you know, dogmatic. No, they said, this company has not changed. It's a business intelligence software company. They do some AI stuff. They make hundred million bucks a year. They have a $32 billion market cap and a $15, $15 billion liquid balance sheet and have raised twice in the convertible debt market for 0.5% on a six year time frame. This is a masterclass in a speculative attack against a weak currency, the dollar, for a stronger currency, Bitcoin, and no one has figured it out yet. And the FASB accounting rules have changed, meaning Saylor did this and he has majority voting shares for MicroStrategy. So, so Bitcoin is treated as an intangible asset in 2020 through 2023, right? So that means that for an intangible asset, they can only mark down their EPS and, and not mark it up. So Bitcoin, if only when it tanked, they would take gap accounting losses. But when it went up, they didn't get gap accounting gains. Yep. Now, Bitcoin with the FASB accounting rule change coming down the pipe, you're going to be able to, to treat it as a cash equivalent. So you have all of these corporate treasurers, the playbook for a corporate treasurer has been borrow at artificially low rates because the Fed's juicing the market with QE, borrow as much money as you can, buy back your stock, pump the stock price, decapitalize the company, right? That's what you're doing. You're, borrow, you're levering up, you're buying your shares, you're pumping the stock price, reducing the shares outstanding, but you're decapitalizing your balance sheet. Totally. Taylor comes in and says, we're borrowing fiat, we're selling equity, we're selling equity, and they're buying Bitcoin. And it's accretive. It Every single Bitcoin purchase he's ever done is in the money. And they've turned a $1.5 billion market cap into a $32 billion market cap in less than four years. This is the biggest story in corporate finance and copycats are coming. They're right? definitely coming. I'll tell you right now, we've got some very uh, large and well-known uh, corporate treasurer clients. Uh, obviously not going to drop names, but but we haven't even had a conversation about Bitcoin yet. 
in, in the three years that we've been operating. So I got to imagine those questions are coming uh, and we will start to see some very large, uh, important and, and market leading type companies uh, really start to make some pivots on this. And it's going to be incremental, right? They're not, you know, a company, those types of companies aren't going to go all in on, on, on a very volatile asset class because they obviously have other sources and uses of their cash. But anything these corporations do at the margins or do at the margins together obviously moves the needle from a stru from a structural standpoint. So again, just don't forget this arrow. You know, it's 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 going to be a wild ride over the over the course of time. But as long as that structural arrow uh, is pointed up, you know, you have a, a ability to manage the cyclical uh, fluctuations. You're going to do just fine managing this asset, and more importantly, just managing broader portfolio risk. Love it. Yeah, I, I don't expect uh, corporations to all you know go 150 percent levered long Bitcoin, but <laughs> no, small no. things are coming. Absolutely, man. Well, thank you for pointing it out. That's uh, I did. I did. I mean, I knew obviously of Michael Saylor, and Michael Strategy. I'd known all of his haters and folks who come at him and come at people like you on Twitter and whatnot. And the reality is, you guys are the ones making money. We're the ones making money, and they're the ones selling uh, busted newsletters. So we'll <laughs> leave it at that. So, uh, Dylan, appreciate you, man. This has been a tour de force. I promised the audience a tour de force this morning. Not only did you deliver one, you it would have exceeded my expectations, man. So just want to say thank you again. Uh, we'll obviously definitely have you back on the program uh, uh, later in the future and. Uh, uh, keep continuing all the best of luck to you uh, and your cronies over at uh, UTXO. Appreciate it, Darius. It's been a lot of fun. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you.